have a special guest in the box seats with us today. I think I think personally it's the best pitcher in UT history when he was playing at UT because I was at a lot of his games back in the 80s. Great guy. Zeke is here. It's Greg Swindell. You know, you know, Mike, uh, University of Texas has been blessed with a lot of great pitching over the years. I mean, Putin, Bobby Lane. I mean, you can go way, way back. You know, of course, Swindell, Clemens. Uh, Dressendorfer, Kieschnick, I don't want to leave anyone out. And then the guys the last 10, 15 years. I mean, yeah. Street, you know, you can just keep naming them. Justin Simmons, I'm gonna, somebody's going to get pissed if I leave these out. <laughs> but there's no doubt that numbers-wise and just performance-wise, uh, Greg's up there in the top, definitely top two or three. Now, everybody can argue, and that's kind of the fun of sports, who's number one. But he's in the top two or three all-time at the University of Texas. And just an overall good guy, has moved on to a great career. Uh, in broadcasting, doing a lot of the Longhorn games, a lot of college games throughout the season. So it's it's going to be a fun one again today. How are you, Zeke? I'm doing great. I'm doing good. It's been a couple of weeks. I had a hip replacement surgery a couple of weeks ago, but um, everything's on the up and up. I'm able to walk a little bit now without um, using a walker or a cane. I'm feeling feeling like it has been 30 or 40 years since I've been in college right now. So, um, no, er, 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 everything is good. I'm starting to feel better, and I'm ready for baseball. What, what's say, going on with that broadcast booth? I don't even know that you and Moreland were this injured when you played. I mean, you guys are going down like flies. I mean, you know, got us all stressed out. So how's Keith doing, too? He's doing great. He, 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 you know, he got had the the incident last at the end of last year, and now I'm starting out this year. I missed the alumni game because of my surgery, so um, we're both on the men. He's doing great, and and I'll be ready. We got a, a week or so till till open the home opener, and I'll be ready for that one. That's why I wanted to go ahead and get this hip done now. How long before you start uh, throwing BP? Oh, if this was 2004, it'd be next week. <laughs> 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 my my. my 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 arms worse off than my hip right now. So I'm, yeah. my my BP days are over. <laughs> They're over. All right. Zeke, Zeke, take us through your journey a little bit. I mean, basically, you know, on the surface, it appears a lot of so I'm a little bit after you. But it's like from the day one you stepped on campus, you just lit it up. I mean, you you know, <laughs> take us through high school and then college and the, and the journey a little bit. Well, that was it. I mean, high school. I went to Sharpstown High School. We had a really good team. We had my uh, junior year, we won the state championship. Nine guys went to the Division One on scholarship. So it was, um, and we grew up together. We grew up from Little League, Pony League, Colt League, Palomino. I mean, growing up together and, and learn, learning how to win together. And that, that's how that success happened early in my career. Uh, my um, the, re- the reason that, or how I got to Texas was Rusty Richards was my high school teammate and best friend since fifth grade. And I've told this story millions of times that Doug Gassaway came out to watch him and, and play a game. And, and he liked what he saw, like how Rusty played the game. But then he, uh, Doug Gassaway told uh, Coach Gus that Rusty, the Richards kid's legit, but you need to get the pitcher. And he said, well, what's his name? He told him my name. He said, well, how hard does he throw? He says, well, 84, 85. And Coach Gus laughed at him. He goes, no, but, but he throws strikes. He gets the ball over the plate, and, and he knows how to win. And with that recommendation, I got the this, this scholarship to Texas. And, and things my, – my fall of my freshman year, um, I was ready to go home. I mean, I, I was getting it handed to me. I, I was thinking I was this, this guy in high school, and now I, I had to take it up to the next level, and I, I couldn't do it. So, I mean, we're playing at the University of Texas. So, in inner squad, you're throwing against all Americans every day. So, I, I was – I was not having fun. I, I was, you know, away from home, the college life, and a lot of it was was not going well. And I was ready to just go home and maybe hit a junior college or something. But um, a lot of the guys talked me in the stand. And then um, the spring of my freshman year, Eric Boudreaux and Wade Phillips got in a car wreck two weeks before the season. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of thrust into throwing. Uh, mm-hmm. Started the first game of the year, didn't do well. Um, but Coach Gus stuck with me, put me back out there in Tempe against Obi McDowell, Barry Bonds, and Mike Devereaux after Bruce Ruffin went four innings. And I finished the game, and my velocity went from 86 to 92. And for some reason, it, it never went back. And I think pitching the rest of that game against that team, Arizona State, uh, just gave me my confidence back that I needed. Wow. And a- after that, I, I pretty much started – 
a lot. Dominating. Yeah. yeah, you were dominating after that. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard stories about your performance out in Tempe for that, that game and how you just you wowed everybody and it boosted the confidence of everyone around you and of you. Yeah, it did. I mean, I, I was surprised because it, 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 I, I pitched against Texas Lutheran the first game of the season, went into the fourth inning and didn't do well and gave us some runs. And there I was again thinking, oh, no, here, here it is. And then something happened. Something happened in Tempe. Uh, I think it was the competition. Uh, Arizona State, that team was, I mean, they put up 25 runs against Oklahoma State in the College World Series that year. And then just for some reason, yeah, I, I, it just – took me to the next level, being able to get the confidence at, at that level against such a historic team. We'd never been University of Texas. We don't travel. We don't go anywhere. And then we went out there and, and, and played the Arizona State Sun Devils. And it was, it was an amazing experience. And um, I did well. And like you said, I, I started after that and uh, just kept going up and up. Compare that 84 season to the 85 season because both were so good. Y'all were both – both seasons, one went away from a championship, and you did great both years. But they were still different in some ways. Yeah. I mean, I, 84, we weren't supposed to win. We um, – they had just won in 83 and lost pretty much the entire team. There wasn't much of a pitching staff coming back. And and we weren't – we weren't – we weren't even ranked at the beginning of the season. And then things just kind of clicked and gelled, and we started – we played well um, at, for that team. And made it to Omaha, and Augie, Augie clipped us in the national championship game with Eddie Delzer, uh, three to one or something like that. And they they won the championship. And then the next year, now now we're good. We're we're the best team I I think that I've been on in my three years there at Texas. We come out of the shoot number one. Uh, we had a couple of twenty game winning streaks, and um, it, it was disappointing in '85. We we had to get beat twice. Miami had to beat us twice. They did. Mm. And, um, you know, that, that was a disappointment because we we were the best team. I don't care what Thunder and Lightning say. Um, we, we were the best team that year, and um, we just didn't get it done. And that's what that's one thing you look back at is we could have had two more national champions on the, on the wall there at the dish if, if we win those. And, and that's, that's the frustrating thing um, that we didn't win. But, um, you know, it was a great experience. Uh, and being at the University of Texas wouldn't change a thing. We'll come back. Ty's going to join us later, and we'll come back to the more Texas stories. But now take us off. You 86, you're the first or second player chosen in the draft, I believe. Was King from Arkansas was there, or something like that? Were you the first guy chosen or second, Zeke? Second. Jeff, Jeff King from Arkansas. Jeff yeah, King. he went for, yeah. for first to Pittsburgh. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, back then, back then we, didn't, we didn't have this kind of stuff. We, we couldn't That's talk right. to each other over the Internet and, and have conversations. So anything you heard about the draft, it was coming from the news, <laughs> coming from Mike, Mike at, at 10 o'clock or coming from the newspaper, the statesman the next day. I had no idea where I was going to go, when I was going to get a phone call on draft day. And um, a few friends called that morning. To I don't know. I told it, no one, nobody called. Nobody called because, you know, back then you had to wait for a phone call. Um, and yeah, Cleveland, Cleveland came in at, Said they drafted me second behind Jeff King, and, and it was, I was excited. I mean, I, I'd never been to Cleveland. I'd never been um, pretty much outside the state my entire life. So um, it was an experience. I was glad that it was over, and then it was time to get the professional career going. You hadn't been outside the state except to Omaha in that, that one trip to Arizona, you know. What? Well, Omaha, Miami, Omaha that's, that's, Omaha. What I was, that's why I was angling. That's right. Omaha kind of like is the state, Omaha. Of, the state of Texas. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So you're the first, you're the second guy chosen, and you go st- pretty much straight to the big leagues. Did you do any minor league time at all? Did you yeah, any I start did. Um, the minor? I did. It, it took about a month. I pitched for the Waco Pirates for a little bit. Went back up to Liberal in in the negotiating um, process, <laughs> and then when we knew it was close, I came home. We signed on July 31st. Um, in 86 and for some reason I circled August 21st on the, on the calendar. I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to be in Cleveland pitching on August 21st. It was kind of a joke, but it was kind of what I want, where I wanted to be. And, and I'll be damned if I didn't pitch against the Red Sox August 21st oh, in wow. Cleveland. So it was, um, it was fast paced. I pitched um, two games, three games in the 
in Waterloo, Iowa, and then got got the the call that I was going to Double A the next the, the next day to pitch. And then when I got to Double A in Waterbury, Connecticut, um, we were playing the New Britain Red Sox, and I got called in after the game, and they said, well, "You're not pitching tomorrow. You're pitching in Cleveland against the Boston Red Sox." And so this is one o'clock in the morning. It was one o'clock in the morning, and uh, call the family and let. And they already know. The, they, they told them earlier so they get tickets to Cleveland. And so that, that kind of um, – I, I wanted to surprise them, but they, they surprised me. And, um, yeah, got to Cleveland around 10 in the morning and then um, pitched that night. And, again, went into the fourth inning, gave up six runs, and the bullpen gave up 18 runs. So it was a 24-5. <laughs> Final oh, no. uh, that first game in Cleveland and um, wasn't wasn't fun, but you, you could look at it as there was only one way to go from there, and that was up. <laughs> and you you went straight up in eighty seven. Eighty seven was an amazing year for you. You've talked before about how nervous you were in the two thousand one World Series. Were you at all nervous in eighty seven because this is your first time going to all these ballparks and facing all these hitters, and you did great. Well, it, it is because I've never been to spring training. Yeah, <laughs> I'd never been. I mean, spring training was in Tucson. We we went out to Tempe, you know, but I mean, it was just a a weird experience just because I don't they don't do that to kids these days. They just they kind of bring them along slowly. Um, I, w- I was thrown into it in 86 and then 87. We were put in the same group with Candy Audi and these guys. And at the end of spring training, the pitching goes well. Um you can read, you can see kind of what's going on. You guys have been in the same group all spring. So you are our five guys. Phil Necro, who was older than my dad at the time, uh, was on the pitching staff. And yeah. it was, um, it was a, a fun experience. And, and to know that, um, that you were going to be on the team, you made it through your first spring training and, and now it's time to, to get back to Cleveland and really just, I mean, I always had fun when I was out there on, on the field and didn't matter where I was and paid my dues in Cleveland. And then, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a great experience. What's that like to have like Phil Necro? You know, just thinking about that. He's older. He's he probably really was. He's probably older than your father. He's on the staff and you're probably, he's telling you to call him Phil, which is probably kind of weird <laughs> instead of Mr. Necro. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, we had him, and then that that year we got uh, Carlton as well. So we we had two guys that were Good my Lord. dad's age on yeah. on the on the on the staff. So it was um, it was it was neat. I mean, Nuxie was quiet, Lefty was quiet, except on days he pitched, which is usually you'd think it would be opposite. But um, he he came out on game days uh, wired and ready to go. And Nuxie Nuxie just was Nuxie. He would, actually he would smoke cigarettes and really was a father figure. I mean, he really was. <laughs> But how was Carlton? We hear these stories. Great pitcher. Steve Carlton's one of the best left-handers of all time, best pitchers of all time. And, but he he had a reputation with the media, at least, of being very introverted and withdrawn. How was he with with a younger person like you, like with a younger player, pitcher especially, a lefty? Too. Great. He, he was great. I mean, I, I would go down and and just watch him throw bullpens. And he would ask, you know, if you, if you want to ask any questions, ask, and the pitching coach was there. He would throw a pitch and, and talk for a minute, throw a pitch, talk for a minute about what he's working on, and how he's going about his, his bullpen. And that, that's kind of my second year in Cleveland. So I'm like, okay, this is what bullpen is all about. This is about just working on your release point with your fastball. If your fastball is not there, working on this and that. And why? I mean, it, it, was, it was just a great experience. He got traded at the, towards the end of 87 and gave me a glove. Gave, gave me a glove, and that was pretty cool. Uh-huh. Um, Nolan was my right-handed hero growing up, and Lefty was my left-handed guy growing up. So it was wow. it was pretty neat. You still have that glove today? You know, what? Uh, I've I've moved so much. I've I've, I've lost so many things. Wow. Um, but it was it was pretty neat. It, it sat sat on a, a counter or somewhere in, in in the office for a long time. Um, Unfortunately, though, we've, we've moved a lot and been through a lot. And things have gotten scattered around. It's somewhere around there, I'm sure. I oh, want to yeah. talk about, I want to talk about your uh, proverbial ups and downs, both at, at UT, not that you had many downs at UT, but in the 
major league career. But did you, did you ever rely on your old friends like the person I'm going to bring in right now, whose name is Ty Harrington, one of your roommates? Did you ever, Ty? How are you? And did you? I'm ever, wonderful. How are you guys? Good. Did you ever fall back on on guys like Ty and say, you know, Ty I had a tough night last night in Cleveland? I, man, I don't know. What do you think? Anything like well, that? Or when, when when Ty was. If I had a rough night in Cleveland, Ty was probably with me during that rough night. <laughs> it's Ty's fault. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was we, we, we did. We, 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 yeah, it was after the rough night. We had a rougher night. We'll put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, Ty, Ty was always there. He always has been. I mean, still is. I mean, we've been friends for almost 40 years. So it's, um, yeah, when I, when I played, I mean, him and Rusty came to a couple cities and we hung out for a weekend and, and just, did, did guy things and it was it was a good time but it was always always great because if you ever needed a boost that's the man to give you a boost right there <laughs> and he does have energy Todd do you remember going up this first couple of years you were still kind of playing at Texas so you probably didn't have much for but 86 seven eight nine well you were coaching then at Texas but did you have time to go and visit him and spend some time with him in Cleveland when he when he was those first four or five years he was in the big leagues yeah, no, when he when he got – maybe his first got called up, um, I went to Cleveland, and uh, which is a kind of a two-story thing. One, um, I'm, I got on the wrong flight, and uh, if you can – connecting flight in Chicago or something like that, ended up back in Atlanta or some I'm not sure that, what all that, happened. That's when, you, that, that's when you said you got on the flight, and it goes, this flight's headed to Atlanta, and you're like, uh, I'm not going to Atlanta. Yeah, you guys. I'm even going to flight to Atlanta. Going to Cleveland, and, uh, exactly. and so they got. I was on the wrong flight, and then, man, you'd have thought every you know uh, stewardess on the plane thought I was you know the king of some great company or country or something because I got so much attention. It was unbelievable. I think they were like trying to make sure it was all okay. I don't know, but anyway, so I got there late. But ironically, as it turned out, as I got into Cleveland, he was pitching against a guy that I'd grown up with my whole life with Andy Hawkins. And, uh, and so I got to see the both of them pitch that night. And, um, and so for me, it was fun to go watch Zeke and, uh, and then also a guy that I'd known literally my whole life and, uh, you know, with Andy. And so it was a great night. It was fun. And then I went up multiple times to, to Cleveland. And then I do remember the night in Cleveland after the game, or maybe it was the next night, we, we went down to the flats. I do remember that, or something like that. And uh, we had a good time after. We can, we can edit. We, we, we can edit, right? We can I'm not edit. going yes. further. I'm, I'm just yeah. going to leave the room for everybody's imagination. At this point. I'm not. That way, I don't incriminate you, me, or anybody else. Yeah. I don't want anybody. There you go. You know. And uh, but it was it really it was a lot of fun. And uh, and then out a couple more times at different places, and uh, I would go see him pitch. And I, you know. It would have been a little bit different now as opposed to then, obviously, because you can watch. You can, if you want to, now you can watch every game. If right. you, you know, I mean, so I would have gotten the scene, you know, throw a lot more, and um, and a lot of people, you know, play a lot more. But certainly, would have got a chance to watch Zeke's career even, you know, closer than I, you know, got to follow it. And uh, and because you just, you know, I'd have to pick up the paper, or if it was on TV, you get a chance to watch it, or you know, whatever it was, but I had to go read a box score the next morning. I don't know if you guys remember doing that. You had to open up the All American <laughs> Stage oh, and go yeah, back. You, right? didn't, you didn't have that big satellite dish, the satellite dish that was on the house yeah. moved around. You know? <laughs> no, that satellite would have been bigger than my house. And, uh, <laughs> I was living in back then. I was a young, aspiring to be kind of wanted to be coach kind of thing. And, uh, and so, but it, I, I was, I remember when he got called up. Um, and then, um, cause it, you know, he didn't spend a whole lot of time in, you know, messing around in minor league baseball. I remember when he signed and, um, I, t- I, I know, told him I pitched for the Waco Pirates. He pitched did. The Waco Pirates. He started a huge brawl in Waco one time because he was, <laughs> he was really good. And the, no, and the whoa, other whoa, 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 whoa. He the started a brawl the, the while he's doing the David negotiation, Rocky. getting innings in. No, I don't hear that. I've, I've never started oh, a brawl in my life. He didn't start it. Everybody got grumpy because it was just Sunday. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. The second game of doubleheader. Half the teams on both sides were hungover and were playing a summer league game. And he rolls out there and punches out like fifteen in a row. Now everybody's you know like. You got out of church late. It wasn't. A, it wasn't a brawl, but it was. 
It was grumpy enough that I was getting my work in. I was getting my work in. <laughs> yeah, they were like, this guy's fixing to go to the big league. He's out here throwing in a summer league game. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it wasn't a whole lot. You know, and you're playing second base, I think, or third base, whatever it was that summer. <laughs> You just kind of sit over your hands in your pocket. There wasn't a whole lot going on. A couple of weak fly balls and a couple of jam shots. You got to throw the ball around a couple of times. And <laughs> that was about the extent of your defensive day. And um, and so, and anyway, then I, I, like I said, I remember the, the, the moment he signed and, um, and his pro career started. And uh, and then it came – then it would come back. Really the only time we would get to see him in an off offseason. Um, and then everybody – because this came up last week during the alumni game. Everybody back then came back. That was such a huge deal. Yeah, and Zeke, big. you can touch on that as a big leaguer. I, you know, I never played. I, I stayed on as a coach. But for you coming back, I mean, what was that like the first time you come back in a, in a professional uniform? Yeah. Well, we, we, we were freshmen the first time the alumni game was ever played. 1984 right. was, was the first, time, first year of the alumni game. And for us to be in, in, in our dugout and look over and see the Clemens, the Owens, the Stralls, the, the Keith Morelands, and, and, and Hootens wearing big league uniforms, it's like, mm-hmm. that, that's, what, that's what you want to do. That's, that's where you want to be. And this is why I came to the University of Texas, because those guys in that other dugout. And then once, once you, you, your career at Texas is over, now, now you've got pride. Now, now you have pride that you have that big league uniform. Now you want to come back and show the young guys that are on the team um, where you can be, what, what can, anything's possible. And just, it was pride for three years wearing the Texas uniform, but then it was even more, even more proud of, of coming back with, regardless of what big league uniform you had on. And because that big league uniform was mainly because you went to the university of Texas. Yeah. You two are both great high school players. Larry, you were too. I'm not talking about you right now though. Uh, you're, you're great high school players in the early '80s. Did y'all know each other at all before you got to Texas? I didn't. No. I knew who. Well, I knew who they were based on. Um, I loved the state high school state tournament. They had won the state championship. Yeah, my freshman that, year. So I knew who they were, but we didn't know each other. We didn't know each other. So how did you become? Yeah. When did you become roommates? How did that all happen? Uh, well, the original version the was Moore Hill Hall uh, yeah. in Moore Hill. He and Rusty were, were roommates because they'd been high school teammates, a longtime <clears throat> friends. Yeah. And uh, my roommate, and you'll recognize the last name, not really based on him as much as his dad. My roommate was uh, Daryl Derryberry. His dad, Bob Derryberry, was the head coach at then Southwest Texas. Uh-huh. And uh, Daryl left after his freshman fall <laughs> and went to play basketball at St. Mary's. So I was right across the hall from him. And uh, so they didn't have a choice but to hang out with me because uh, <laughs> I was right there. <laughs> and and uh, we had a lot of commonality and a lot of different things. We, uh, I'll say this. He, he and Rusty were the first ones that really, you know, being from Waco, you don't get in, you don't, or I didn't have a whole lot of hip hop in my life. And uh, it was usually just, you know, country music and some Southern rock. And these guys come in from Houston and uh, and I'll, and he'll remind you that it was like fifteen five A or some whatever district it is the greatest district in, in America of high school baseball and he'll tell you that in just a second because I had to hear eight, it eighteen eighteen eighteen, 18 five A yeah eighteen five A my bad and <laughs> uh, and so and then they they introduced me to you know different music that they brought with them from Houston and it was like eye opening and good and fun and then. Um, to, well, it was a gap uh, band, a, cool in the game. Yeah, the gap band, cool in the game, and uh, the gap band was probably that was the one that you know, kind of took me to a different level of listening to it because I'd, I'd heard cool in the gang and kind of knew who they were. Yeah, you're acting like this is band. Rihanna at the Super Bowl or something. I mean, that's a, <laughs> no, I just didn't know. I mean, I, right there. I mean, come on, I mean, it was like you know you listen to WACO and Waco and then uh, whatever the other KRZI or whatever it was, and that was it. There wasn't a whole lot of options going on out there in Waco, McLean <laughs> County. And uh, unless you picked up stations from Dallas, and, uh, and so, and uh, I don't know. And then he and I and Rusty became close friends, and then uh, you know moved in apartments. I, w- I will say this: one of the greatest times of my life. I I would go back to if I could, just based on now how much fun it was, and just how 
unusual it was. Moore Hill Hall was just unusual. <laughs> unusual. There were a lot unusual. of the unusual things. That, it was nuts down there. The da- David Denny? Denny? Was Denny oh, in the middle of some of that? Yeah. No, he was older. We walked in there one night. We, we had to go off campus for that. <laughs> there was, it was like uh, caution signs in the hallway and blinking lights and stuff that other people, I mean, you never knew what you were going to run into. And uh, it was dorm life. And uh, but it was it was certainly a, a fun and and, uh, and a good time. Is it getting back getting back to your pro your big league career? You're in Cleveland. I, know you're, I think you're an all star in '89. Take us just take us forward over the next you know the next ten years, kind of on that journey again. Yeah, well, '88. 80, I, I thought I was going to have. Uh, I mean, looking back, could have been here. I started the season ten and one um, that year. And then I had a had a reporter come to me talk about the All Star Game. I'm like, the All Star Game is a month and a half away. I could I could lose eight or nine in a row. I'm, I'm ten and one. How, how am I going to lose eight or nine in a row? Well, I went out and lost eight in a row before the break. So I was ended up ten and nine at the All Star break. Uh, kind of jinxed myself right there. Um, so that season ended up winning 18 games, and then and that was a, a season after coming off having ligaments pull away from the bone in my elbow. And um, through 242 innings that year, wow. and then the next next year came out uh, hot again, and, and and made the All Star team that year. Um, that's where I was got to be teammates with Nolan out in Anaheim um, at, at the All Star game, and that was one of the coolest things ever um, to to see him just go about the process and and to be on the same field with with all these guys. That I mean, you look up at these guys growing up, and now you're in the same. My, my locker mate was Carl Yastrzemski. He was the, the American <laughs> League captain that year. And it's like, wait a minute. And, and, and uh, Reagan, Reagan comes walking through. It's like, am I, am, am I in the right place here? Am I, am I sure I'm supposed to be here? And I got the pitch. I, I did well. I still have it recorded. They had, had it on MLB Network the other day, so I recorded my inning in two-thirds. Um, so you do an inning in two-thirds in the All-Star game? I did. And then they pulled me. Can you believe that? Well, La Russa came, came out and got me. Good lord, that usually don't work, guys. That long unless you start. Hey. My goodness, or did you start? Did you start that game? Uh, well, I. Yeah, I was eleven and two. I should have started. Well, that's a good point. I mean, <laughs> hey, that's that's but, a Bo Jackson game, man. Bo Jackson hits the bomb to center field. It, 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 Bo Bo went deep first batter, and Wade Boggs went deep second batter. So we're up two nothing right out, right out of the shoot, and then um. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, Dave Stewart started that game. He was in Oakland A. Tony Russo was the Oakland A's manager. I get it. But looking back, damn right, I should have started that game. <laughs> hey, a little bitter. See, I, I got the bitter right far there. off right there. I'm going to turn the air down. I'm starting to sweat. Hey, we are talking about the All-Star <laughs> game. Here. We're not talking about your little league team or your know, first college start. We're talking about the All-Star game here now. Yeah. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah. That was a neat thing. And then uh, got traded from – Cleveland to Cincinnati and, and the winter of 91. I think we were at El Arroyo that night at, at Beach Fest and, and got the call. That, that was a big party we used to have every off season where the guys would come back and um, got the call that I was going to Cincinnati and had a good year there um, and then became a free agent, signed with Houston, um, thought it would be good going back to my hometown. Um, it was, it was, um, not professionally wise. Um, I, didn't, I didn't pitch as good as, as I should have or could have in Houston, got released from Houston. Um, though that's uh, demoralizing when, when you're supposed to be, you know, one of the top free agents a couple of years ago, and now they're just releasing you and just eating the money that they owe you. It's telling you how, how bad you are at the time. Um, but it worked out for all parties. My, my career continued, and the guy they brought up when they released me was some guy named Billy Wagner. Y'all know that guy? <laughs> yeah, he had, he had a pretty good. He had, ended up having a pretty good career. I, I, I tell him all the time when, when he goes to the Hall of Fame, I need some more love because he couldn't have done it without me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, but after that, became a relief pitcher in, in Minnesota. My my career went seven seven more years, and ended up going to Arizona and pitching a couple times behind Randy and and Kurt and winning the World Series. So that was. Um, a, a pretty cool deal. How fun was that for you, Ty, watching him succeed? No, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I had a front row seat in college. 
And uh, to be honest with you, I mean, it was, um, you know, now that when, when I started coaching, I started to understand the game even, uh, well, in my mind, I started to understand the game a little bit better. And um, it became even to me more uh, impressive what he had done in college. And then what he was going into the next level, going into big leagues and, and, and being able to win and be successful and stay in the big leagues that long, knowing the level of baseball and how hard that really is and how hard the game is and how to, how to hone your craft that long and be able to stand in something where everybody's competing to get your spot every day, every year. That's, you know, somebody's trying to take your place. And so I, it, for me, it was always, it was fun to follow and, and, but I got a better understanding once I started coaching and then spending time, you know, watching him go from a starter to a reliever to extend his career and then find different ways to, and, and, and I hope this comes out the right way, find a way every year to reinvent himself as he got older <laughs> so that he could stay on a big league roster. Mm -hmm. And and how you got to work your way through that, how you have to stay healthy and all the different things that you have to do to stay in the game that long. And then, you know, and I can still remember the story he tells it himself, but as a as a fan and as a friend watching him pitch in the World Series, and, you know, he's he had a runner on, he comes in with a runner on or something, I can't remember, I think he was facing Posada, and he may have already told this story, and he's got a grin on his face as he's engaged on the rubber in the set <laughs> position, and I'm like, holy cow, only him, this is, this is, this is just Greg Swindell at, at, at its peak right here, and he's, you know, standing in the greatest, you know, the biggest venue in the world for baseball. This is the moment that any anybody wakes up or goes to bed at night thinking about as an aspiring baseball player. And he's got his spikes dug in on the dirt out there in, in uh, Yankee Stadium with a grin on his face. I mean, that's it tells you one of the of the journey, the path, but also speaks volumes to me, speaks volumes of his recognition of where he was, how he got there. And then just how beautiful that moment was for him. Greg, um, what were you thinking about? What were you thinking nope. about with that smile on your face? That's exactly what I was thinking about. I'm in Yankee Stadium. Right. Pitching in a, pitching in a World peak. Series. Yeah. And I did. I just kind of – I looked around and just kind of took a deep breath, and I just kind of let, let, let it out. And when I let it out, I looked at Bernie, who was on first, Bernie Williams, and he kind of gave a grin – and and Grace, Mark Grace is over there. He kind of looked at Bernie and looked at me like, "What, what, what are you guys doing here?" I'm like, "It was, it, it was, it was taking taking in the moment, and and that, that that was all it was." And it was, I I smiled a lot. I laughed a lot at myself on the mound because that was my way of of kind of just comforting, kind of kind of easing into things. I, I didn't want to get out there and right. throw the rosin bag or try try to throw hundred miles an hour. Right. I would get over myself, laugh at myself. And because some you give up a long home run, I would look at it and be like, "Wow, I should have made a better pitch right there," and, and kind of let, let made, made a smile. Or I can't believe it only went that far. Should have went a lot further than that. Um, but my my way of, of easing tension on the mound was taking deep breaths and, and just taking it all in and smiling. What was it? What was the key to your success as a pitcher? Was it was it your command? Was it your stuff? A combination of the two? Or what do you know? What do you think made you successful at the college, then major league level, and then as a reliever, you know, at all through your stages of your big league career? I never backed down. I mean, I, 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 I wanted to throw strikes. I was taught at eight years old, throw strikes, throw strikes. And I, I, never, I never gave in. One time I threw a 3-2 changeup to, to Lance Parrish and walked him with the bases loaded, and I could have kicked myself in the butt because I gave in at that moment. I didn't go with my, my number one, my fastball. And so uh, I, I, I was confident. People call it cocky. I, I might have been. I, I was very confident in, in my ability all the way to the end. Um, I still am. I, I can't walk, but I, I'm confident in what I can, <laughs> what I can do. Um, but that, that the biggest thing, yeah, I, I could command my fastball, and I, I wasn't afraid of a challenge. I, 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 love, I love the competition and challenging. Ty, that's his personal. What was yours from the outside looking in as a teammate and friend? The, what made him so good as a, as a pitcher? Well, I think he – I mean, one is confidence, but from a uh, – and his competitive nature. I mean, I don't think people – I'm going to say this too. I don't think too many people know this. I mean, he's a pretty accomplished athlete. 
I mean, you're not talking to a guy that was a one-dimensional, um, can just grab a baseball and throw it. There was a lot more to him as an athlete. I mean, I don't want to make yeah, him please, look like please, please I don't want to make him. Huh? Yeah. Please elaborate to the people a little bit more than that. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about Bo Jackson over here. Boost his ego a little bit. Yeah, yeah come I on. don't want to, you know, but there were many a pickup games. Hey, you know, in here. Listen to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good. There, there were, I mean, you know, I mean, if you asked him to, he always was doing something. So like, he, he had a football in his hand at practice, messing around, throwing passes, or we'd go to Gregory Gym. He was playing basketball. There was always something going on or playing golf. And so if you said, we're going to do this, he can do it. I mean, so a lot of people don't really understand or maybe don't didn't have an opportunity to appreciate just how good of an athlete he was. The second part of that was, you know, the, well, the, the competitiveness to me was was through the roof. I mean, it, you know, some people love to step into the moment and some people want to stand just on the edge of it. And uh, and he was the first one to put two feet in on the, on the line going towards the moment. But – um, the other thing about it was fastball command was I, I don't know that I've ever seen but a handful of pitchers in my career, even coaching and playing with them that had fastball command of that. You know, you hear people talk about um, being able to throw the bat, their, their fastball on both sides of the plate. And it's true. But if you probably went back in, in Zeke's history, you could see that he went to the top of the strike zone and elevated fastballs better than anything I'd ever, better than anybody that I've been around and, you know, coaching or playing with for sure on, on that piece of it. I think that um, being able to have the confidence to, to drill balls in when you've got really small windows against great hitters, that's not easy to do. And you're really having to drill that thing in there. Um, and I thought he always had the, the, the ability to do that and, uh, and the confidence and the emotions to do it. Uh, the will, how competitiveness, whatever word you want to draw up about great athletes, um, he always had the ability to do that. But I'll go back to, and he said it himself when he was eight years old, his dad taught him how to throw a baseball and how to reach down and touch the ground. And when he would throw it and how to had to throw it in the same spot over and over and over, he carried the ball from a physical level. He carried the ball a lot further than a lot of pitchers did. So you would hear people say all the time, and I, I didn't strike out much. I couldn't hit, but I couldn't strike out. I didn't strike out much. But the reality was I, he, he had great deception on his fastball. And now, like I said, going back to what I originally said, when I learned more about the game, he had a, a tremendous hip turn, which is probably why he has hip issues now. But he had a tremendous <laughs> hip turn, and he carried the ball further. Mm -hmm. He put it right on top of you. You didn't see it till it got really, really close to you. And, uh, and some of that people, it is physical. It is, there is, you know, uh, when you look at people that do that and can carry the ball further and, and put four seam rotated on it and high, high spin rates and all the kind of stuff you find out today, it makes sense. But then you also have to have the emotional ability to drive those balls in those small windows. And, and I thought that was something that, you know, he stood above a lot of other people because I mean, he threw a spike breaker and, Change up occasionally in college, um, but if you, I mean, you got right down to it. If you draw an arrow around or circle around this pattern, it was pretty. It wasn't complicated. It was fastballs in three different space, in three different places. That that leads me. What 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 adjustments or tweaks did you have to make, Greg, going to the majors? And, you, and like you went, you went straight there pretty much. As from college to major league baseball, what tweaks? In your repertoire pitches, or what? What? What adjustments did you have to make pretty quickly? Yeah, that, um, the biggest thing at, at the next level after college was was that when you're behind two one two zero in college, I, I could tell you I'm, I'm throwing a fastball. fastball. I mean, I could only do that in the big league. I could only do that to, to Pete Incavilla in the big leagues, and he still couldn't hit it. But <laughs> <laughs> this because he's probably he, he, he's going to listen to this too. You know that, right? Oh, I, I, and and he knows. He knows, um, but it, it was the, making the adjustment when you were behind two one two zero three one of having the confidence of, of coming up um, with with the curveball. I came up with a changeup uh, later in my career, a splitty, and, and to have the confidence in in those situations where you're not going to throw a two zero fastball by a big league hitter. It doesn't doesn't matter. You might get away with it two times out of ten, but the other eight they're going the other way and they're going the other way hard. So um, it was it was about coming up with, with something off speed behind in the count and, and, and working on that. And most of the time though, you, you, you didn't want to fall behind. 
uh, but there there were times where you had to, and and you had to had to try something. And don't get me wrong, there were times when when I tried the two o fastball or the three o three one fastball, and um, it worked. But for the most part, um, yeah, just coming up with something something secondary in those situations that, that was the biggest adjustment for me. So there's more pitching backwards as you raise up. I as I got higher, I faced guys that were coming down that had been the big league. They you just noticed they pitched different. Like you were saying, three one two oh, you could always sit dead red in college. You get higher up in pro ball, you don't know what's coming. You still look fastball, but I mean, you, they will pitch. They pitch backwards, you know. And 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 big big league hitters are looking for. You hear Keith talk about it on on the One one spot, one place, one spot, and that's what they're doing. So they're they're almost it's almost easier at at the big league level because if you do hit your spots and you can trick them occasionally in the minor leagues, they're up there hacking. They're, they're going to be swinging at everything. So right. with the big leagues, they're looking, they're looking for that one pitch, that one spot. And if, as long as you can keep it away from there um, and, and mix it up, uh, you, facing a couple of teams twice in a row, you had, you had to do things different. But, um, yeah, but finding that spot and, and hitting it, that was, that was the biggest key. Back in the 80s and 90s, they used to say the American League was more of a curveball league and it was a fastball league in the National League. Did you find that to be true, Zeke? Uh, I mean, no. I mean, I, I, the way you pitched between the leagues. I, I, I think because of the designated hitter back in the day, uh, that was the that was the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you had to have that that off speed behind in the count, and and being in Cleveland and and being in the American League, I had had to adjust pretty quick to it because after a twenty five, my first start, uh, what what else can you got? You got to come up with something after that. And made the adjustment and, and let me start for 10 years and let me relieve for seven more after that. Well, I would think, too, the ballparks in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of the, the, the newer ball, ballparks that were huge, sort of like Dish, Dish Falk used to be huge in the National League, artificial turf, mm -hmm. 380 of the gaps, 14, you know, they were big ballparks. Where the American League still had some of the older ballparks – that were more conducive, you know, to home runs and fly balls going out. So probably another reason it was a fastball league. You know, you couldn't get hurt as well. Yeah, and, then, and and that's what I have. a lot of pitchers get hurt when they go to Fenway or they go to, to Yankee Stadium, old Yankee Stadium, or or Baltimore, or the old stadium, because you try to make an adjustment to your game and pitch differently. And you really didn't have to. As long as you stuck with your game plan, you didn't have to change. When you start trying to change, you start making mistakes, and that's when you get hurt. <laughs> That's almost that's, that's that's interesting. Almost it was a mental thing more than just do what you do and let the chips fall where they may. Oh, yeah. You start trying to tweak and change, and you get burned. Right? You walk out in the, and you walk out of the, the visiting dugout in Boston, and the monster looks like this wall, like four feet away. So of course, as a pitcher, you're going to think, well, I can't throw anything in, I can't hang anything. Right. They're going to hit it over. Well, if they hit it over the monster, it's going to go out of any ballpark anyway, because it has it has so the, the trajectory. It's going to make it out of any ballpark. It might be the floating single or floating double that's going to hurt you. But yeah, once you tried to change and, and pitch differently, it wasn't going to happen. Okay. Y'all brought up Pete and Cavillia earlier. I've got to ask you both about <laughs> 19, I think it's 1984 Oklahoma state comes to the dish and Inky. I've heard the stories about him challenging the entire dugout. Hodo's got to be on for this. We're going to get Hodo and yeah. I may have to text him say, Hey, you better get on here. Tell me what y'all remember about that. <laughs> we, we remember we, we remember Gary Ward saving our life. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, there's a lot he was of the last one to too. he was the last one to grab him before he he, he got to the dugout. So it, well, it was we I think we had just finished up a series against Rice earlier in the day. Um, we had to finish a game and then complete another game. And this game was on ESPN. It was on ESPN. One of the, one of the early games on ESPN. And um, of course, they're playing him up, the big guy, his slugging percentage, and our entire team. What we have 40 people out there watching him take batting practice. And I don't know if he hit one in the park. I think everything he hit went out of the park. And and we started making like, ooh. And then he hit another one. We'd all go, oh, like you're watching fireworks <laughs> or something. And then you know, it was a few a few big guys, oh, the big guy, look at me. And after about seven or eight of those, he he had enough. And he came out of the batting cage and was pointing his bat at our dugout saying, if you guys are a bunch of front running, blah, blah, blahs, I'll whip all y'all's butts. 
me. I'll take all of you on. You could have heard a pin drop. Nobody said a word. There, there, <laughs> I heard everybody actually, ran actually, back in. <laughs> actually, there was a at the door to the locker room. There were people like trying to get in from each other. Yeah. They couldn't get in fast enough. Yeah, I was I was stuck on the other end. I couldn't go anywhere. I'm like, oh gosh, come on, Gary. Coach Ward, Coach Ward, get this guy, get this guy. And luckily, uh, right before he got to the warning track in front of the dugout, um, he finally stopped. Now there's some boss I, I, a... Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I, no, I was saying I, I've got to know Pete really well, and he. He loves that story. He always likes to hear me say it, and he just laughs. laughs. And and he's he's the biggest teddy bear. He's the biggest teddy bear out there. I don't think he would have done anything, at least not with the sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, the only thing I'll add on that, and, he, and Zeke, that story hasn't changed much. It's true. The language has changed just for this because it's PG or <laughs> yeah. PG thirteen. That's right. But <clears throat> and, and I never really thought of it that way. That Gary might have saved all of our careers. <laughs> and I may need to thank him for it someday. But I, the, the only piece of that other addition to that story, too, and, and a lot of that is true, but he had a line drive that night. And I know you guys know that Kobe Curlin was playing short for us, and Kobe was not the tallest guy on the field. And he hit the line drive that Toby, I mean, that Kobe jumps for, and it goes to the wall. And I just remember thinking to myself, I mean, he just backspanned the ball that just went over the shortstop's head. It's 5'7". And goes all the way to the wall. And I remember thinking to myself, this this dude is a – well, not that we didn't already know he was a monster anyway. Yeah. Right. Wow. What about – now, wasn't there some Bo Bosworth story back in that era too, wasn't there? Yeah. That was 85? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah 85 in our, in, at OU. That's, that's, that's another one. Another one we need Hodo in on. Yeah. yeah that's I've already texted him. I don't know. I you you, you need to story. wait some time because – that is Hodo's story. He is part of that. He is a part right, of that. We story. get Doug on. We'll we'll get to that. That'd be great. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. It's a good story too, and a fun story. The, the, and I, and I can tell you this: Tony Casillas, who I saw later on in life at a uh, at an a, event for some kind of charity event in uh, in Victoria, Texas, and he and I started at first time I'd met Tony since that night. I had kind of innocently brought that story up, and he got to laughing and and giggling along because he was part well, of. Because he was right next to Bosworth, night. he was right next to him. <laughs> the cliff note, the cliff, cliff note version of it is, he almost made it in, into our dugout like Incavilia. He wanted to come over the top because we were John, <laughs> we were John with him, and you know a bunch of the football guys were over our dugout. And I think was it that night we got rained out, and we had to walk right through them to get to the bus. Wow. <laughs> and we he were reached we were really nice. Coach Bethay's hat. Remember, he reached he out and he, grabbed he was, Coach Bethay's hat. He was so mad, and it's it's but funny now. Years but at later, the time, Greg, you were with with uh, Bosworth, like here in Austin at a Home Depot or something, and uh, I think you guys Facetimed Hodo. I mean, I'd see him at the at Lifetime at at the gym, and he he always have the sweat thing on and trying to hide so people didn't recognize him and i, I saw him garner actually saw him in academy one time and, and, and brought it up to him at academy there in austin and, and now now it's just it, people laugh about it but whew, that's, that's that's twice um careers could have been ended very early <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be careful sometimes uh, uh, well that dugout in the 80s was a different i would love to have had um, I'd love to have had a microphone and a, and a, you know, recorder. some type of recorder on a lot what went on in there. I mean, all the way back to similar to those two stories, and then, you know, the, the third baseman from A and M when he made the five errors and uh, Matoya, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you see eight gloves come out of our dugout, you know, throwing gloves at him because he he and he and he, he meant it innocently, but it, to us we took everything with such great pride or however you want to look at it. I'm not sure, but he made the comment and the. Uh, in the post or the pre-tournament um, interviews, that I, I see why people don't make errors on this AstroTurf. And after his third or fourth error, you saw about eight gloves go flying into the third base box from our yeah. dugout. <laughs> yeah. he, 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 he talked a bunch of crap and then made five errors. So he deserved yeah. the glove toss. <laughs> yeah. uh, he got it because there was a bunch of them. And you think about if that happened today. <laughs> 
what that mean and what that would be like on social media and everything else. And you saw about uh, eight gloves come flying out of the dugout. And Kevin Kibido had to go out there and pick them up. And uh, we would know. To bring them up. <laughs> yeah. We would know what was going on. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is true. I'm, I'm going to tell you this, and, I, and Zeke is telling me, telling his story. Because at some point, I know you guys are going to ask, and uh, or somebody's going to say something to it. And that, there's a lot of great, you know, success stories of when you when you're around Zeke and all the you know unbelievable things and games he pitched and and uh, whether it was a no hitter or complete games, which he seemed like he threw a complete game every yeah. every time he went out there. Yeah. And uh, but I, you know, one of the greatest comebacks that I was a part of was our '85 team in in uh, College Station. And we have. I still a, don't remember this. I still don't remember that. That is not true. He just won't admit it. But it, they were, we're down nine, eight or nine in the eighth inning in College Station. We'd won game one and two. Uh, Zeke could pitch a complete game on Friday night. And um, we start making a, what's going to be a, a fairly typical UT comeback, but it's in College Station. And um, next thing you know, we're, we're down three or four, and the next thing you know, Rusty Richards hits a ground ball, of all things, a ground ball that goes all the way to the outfield fence. And uh, we, with the bases loaded, I think we scored two or three, and then Chuck Erdley comes up in the ninth and gets a base hit. Dodd Johnson, God rest his soul, had one of the most incredible weekends I've never ever seen. And that day, you know, I don't remember how many homers and doubles he had and, and all the above, and and it was just one of those really magical weekends for if you were a UT guy, not if you probably were an Aggie fan. But and we start trudging our way back. When early gets a base hit, we score the go ahead, the tying run, and the go ahead run. And I was standing next to Clint Thomas, our pitching coach, and we had a guy that was a pretty high draft pick on the mound at the time. And um, and he first rounder from the Indians. Yeah, and um, and all of a sudden person's kind of standing next to me putting his shoes on tying his shoes grab somebody takes off for the bullpen because the bullpen was down the right field line and um it goes down and gets you know gets loose coach Gus is we go ahead you can see coach Gus you know, walking with his hands in his back pocket back from third base you know not in a hurry and uh making his way over and Clint's standing there and all of a sudden Swindell comes running out of nowhere and taps the guy on the back and says, I got it. And he runs out to the mound. We go one, two, three, and I'm not that he's Ball game over. And if he tells you you don't remember that he's not telling you the truth. And part of his inspiration, and I'm going to leave the guys out of this, one of his uh, high school competitors that played at A&M had been, somebody had been talking smack and all this kind of stuff to him or something. And he said, I just got tired. I just decided I was going to go to the mound and get the last three outs and did. But basically coach Gus gets to the dugout coach goes looking around and we're all, you know, he Clint just kind of standing there and he goes, Hey, you got uh, Swindell's in the game. And he just kind of pointed at him. <laughs> And never, never went to the whole play, never anything like that. Was that in game two or three of the series? End of the series. Was it into the series? Three get game three? Three. Because he knew he'd thrown Friday night. Complete oh, yeah, game. Well, back in the day, back in the day, it was Friday to Saturday. Yeah, two, Saturday. double hundred on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> That's what you had, Lowry. You had double hundreds on Saturdays, too. That didn't change until after you were gone. Okay. Okay. So we didn't play a lot of Sunday games back then? Is that what you're saying? No. Okay. Now they got A and M did. We had three. We went to three game series with A and M. Six, is that right? Eighty six or something like that. Maybe eighty seven. Really? I thought so, but oh. may, maybe not. And then oh, I know A and M was the first one that we went to three game series with because they wanted three gates, and I think even TV got involved on a Sunday or or something like that. Huh. And um, but there was there was a lot of there was a lot of joyous. And, and all the above. You remember Coach Gus coming back on the bus on that 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 same weekend, and uh, we were driving home. Of course, we're all trying to figure out how to get a payphone to call all of our friends and our girlfriends to tell them to go get all the beer. So when we get there, we can all you know have a big party after we get back. We didn't have a cell phone, so you had to communicate some way. And um, I remember driving back, and Coach Gus comes back in the back of the bus. And we're all singing and acting crazy because that was a, truly a, a, one of our better comebacks on the, uh, that I'd ever been a part of. And, uh, and it was the Aggies. 
and it was the Aggies. And uh, and he comes walking back there, and, and he goes, well, if I'd known you guys were going to be singing, I'd have brought my guitar. That's the first time I ever knew he played the guitar, ever. <laughs> he goes, I'd have brought my guitar. If we go, this guy's going to be back there singing. We're, now, we were probably singing who knows what back there. But anyway, and uh, we got back, and that was the game if we – if we won that game, we assured ourselves at least a tie for the conference championship, and all we had to do was beat U of H one time uh, at our place or something like that. And uh, but it is true, he took the mound. And don't let him tell you anything different. And he did not. He checked himself in the game. <laughs> then Coach Gus checked him in just to make it real. This is another thing I don't remember. <laughs> I've done. I've done it's a, a lot. Gr- it's I've, a great I've story. It is a great story. I love it when you tell it. Yeah. Well, let's get personal with the two of y'all because y'all have been good friends for almost 40 years. And you've, you've gone through lots of ups, but you've gone through some downs, uh, especially personally, whether it's with family stuff or health stuff. How much have y'all relied on each other through the years? That's a great man. That's what, man. That's what friends do. That's what, yeah. that's, what, that's what friends do. I mean, um, the three years that I spent in Austin were three of the best of my life. I went from 18 to 21. You, you kind of grew up a little bit. And the, the guys that we met there are, are guys that we still keep in touch with today, mm-hmm. um, 35, 40 years later. So in everything we go through, not just myself and Ty, uh, all of us, um, yeah. we're all there. We're usually on a, on a text string now. And, and if, if something goes wrong, I mean, there's nobody else I'd want to be next to me is Ty and Rusty and Doug, and all these guys is because this life has brought us curveballs a lot, a lot of curveballs. Mm-hmm. No, I, I think, you know, and Zeke's right on when he says that there's not, there's nothing that's happened in my adult life. And I'll use the word adult life because when I got to college my freshman year, at least I was resembling the age and, mm-hmm. There's nothing that's happened in my life that Zeke wasn't a part of, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and the same mm-hmm. for Rusty and, and Hoda and some other people that were teammates, but which we're talking about the two of us. Um, there's been very little in my life, personally or professionally, um, that you know Zeke hasn't been a part of. Um, you know, whether it was my coaching career, whether it was, you know, certainly the health. <clears throat> I mean, I look up one day. You know, and I just gotten back from um, my first round of treatments, you know, for cancer, and I'm laying in bed, and I feel terrible. I mean, just terrible. And um, and I look up, and Zeke's laying right next to me, just say, hey, what's up? What are you doing? I mean, literally in bed with me, and we laid in bed and, and talked for hours. And um, I know through his life and different, you know, good or bad, different things that have happened on personal levels, it's just kind of worked out that we've always been in that same um, atmosphere, that same universe to, to make sure each other were okay. And really, and Zeke's right, there's a lot to playing at the University of Texas. But I think there's this, there's this us against the world that puts you closer to the person next to you on that team. I'm not going to use the word bunker because we're not in a war. But it's in, in similar, you know, fashion mm-hmm. that, you know, it was always everybody was out to get you in Texas. So you had this different bond that is really hard to find at other places. Mm-hmm. And I think that added to everybody's emotion or to their friendships, to their their bro- to the brotherhood when you get right down to it, which is Coach true. They say we got always have a target every night on our back, you know. Yeah. yeah. So. And I think because of that, it makes you closer. Um, and when the more that you're close with somebody, the more you find out and that just draws you even deeper into the emotional and, and the love for somebody or the relationship with somebody. And that, that he, mid to late eighties group seems closer than, than any I've ever been around. I'd say the early mid eighties, early to mid eighties. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you yeah. know, which, we, which, we didn't which, have, it's great to see. We didn't have, we, we didn't have internet. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't, I mean, right. So yeah. we, you had each off. other. We we hung we hung out. <laughs> yeah, we had right. each yeah. other, and that's 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 the only way we could see each other, talk to each other. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't gonna be a text message. Now now we kind of have to because we're all over the map. But yeah. um, back the back then we 
we'd get a case of beer and we'd hash things out regardless of, of what the deal was. Yeah. Well, I would add, to, I would add to that too. And this is selfish on my part. And, um, I would add a piece. It takes special characters for that too, in my mind. I mean, I, I think the timing, the setting, um, all of that go into play um, for what we were, what we were as a baseball program in our minds at that point. But I think it took the special, special characters and special people um, for that to be. And it's just there once in a while the stars line up that pieces of your life you get into the right situation with the right people and the right time and and special things that go with it and you really recognize later on you're kind of like holy shit was this really just were we just a part of something like this and then um and then you you kind of selfishly hold it in that this is you know that group or this is that moment in your life and i just sometimes i think again ut made it all happen there were so many pieces of that, so many coaches, so many, the era, all of that. But I guess for me, selfishly, and I would be the one that would say, I think it took special characters to be a part of that too. Yeah. Zeke, your opinion on that? Kind of what Ty said or? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm at the bottom of the totem pole with these guys when it comes to character and, and, and men. I mean, I'm, I'm still a, a goofball and do stupid stuff, but um yeah, I wouldn't wouldn't be where I am today, good or bad, with, without the group that we were with, because like I said, we we've still communicated after this long, and there's no one around that that as soon as something if it happens to go bad, ties the first one to call. Yeah. Rusty's the first one to call. I mean, it's it's these guys and the relationship we've had for for our entire life, and and. And it's, it's getting stronger as we get older. I mean, mm-hmm. it is. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> um, you get closer to the finish the older, line. Yeah. 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 I mean, we're, we're, we're right there. We're all in it together. So um, uh, you never you never know. You never know when, when our day is going to be. So we, we love each other and hang out. And we've, we've lost a few guys over the last couple of years. You mentioned Dodd yeah. and uh, Gardner, or Gar- Garner, mm-hmm. Kevin. Mm-hmm. Um, Mike you know. Anderson. Yeah. 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 So, um, it, it kind of makes it's, you it's crazy. You know, yeah. You never know. You never know when you wake up if it's going to be someone else. So, thank, thank you, thank you, stars, and, and and appreciate the time you have with everyone. Yeah. yeah. Makes you I think every, friendship friendship even more. Yeah, I, I I think so too. I think if people if people ask and they do like, you know, in different conversations, they always ask what, what time in your life would you go back to? And, you know, for me, it it would be to go back to college, not, not for the normal response that most people say, you know, most people would say college because there's this newborn freedom, this new, you know, idea that you get to be who you want to be and do different things. Mine was probably would be because the, the longest lasting relationships that I've got, were developed and, and discovered and developed through college and, and through the University of Texas in my time there. And, and those are the longest lasting, most involved and intense you know, relationships that I've had over the years. And so when people always say, what time in your life? Well, shit, that's easy for me. I'm going back to college with these guys, but it's gotta be at that <laughs> place and it's gotta be with those same people yeah. for me to do it. Yeah, you don't wanna start fresh. You guys, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. you guys have um, both gone into broadcasting, doing a lot of TV, radio stuff. Talk about that, Greg. Talk about that, how that transition was. And we've talked before how much how much you've grown as an announcer, a color guy, and play-by-play guy, you know, over the last six, seven, eight years that you've done that. Um, yeah, how have you enjoyed sweet. it? You know, how's that been a transition? It keeps you close to the game, I'm sure, you know. That's 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 the that's the biggest thing. It it keeps you close to the game. Uh, you, you're gonna be around a ballpark, either, whether it be the major leagues or college, and you're gonna see people and meet people, and you never know what door that might open. Well, this one I, I started doing pregame, postgame in Arizona, um, what oh nine and, and ten, and then all of a sudden the Longhorn Network comes up, and they were saying, well, not not too many people are beating down the doors for an analyst job, and I said. Well, I'll do it. <laughs> like, have you ever done? It? I'm like, no, 
but I mean, I, I, I like baseball, I like Texas baseball. I mean, I like everything about it. I mean, and, and hopefully I can grow, you know, just by, by doing one of the best and, pitchers and, ever too. I mean, come yeah. On. I mean, I mean, come on, let's go. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it did, it, it happened. And, and I got the job and it, the first couple of years, I got 20 games, I got 25 games and, um, and I, I think for me personally, you're only as good as, as the guy next to you. And right now, the last four years, uh, five years, I've, I've had Zonk next to me, and he, he's one of the best. He, he's a great analyst. He says he's not a good play-by-play guy, but I beg to differ because he's very good. And we've just we've developed a, a good repertoire, a good relationship in the booth as well as outside the booth. Known known him a long time as well, and it's mainly now. It's, it's just two guys having conversation is, is all it is mm-hmm. talking about the game of baseball, enjoying the game of baseball, enjoy. It, it helps when you have a good product. I'm not going to lie. When, when you have a good product on the field, that always makes it a little easier. Um, and you, you, cause you never want to bash a young guy, but sometimes you have to. Um, but I, I've, en- I've enjoyed it. It's opened doors to, to other things. I'm going to go out and do, I think 15 or so diamond back radio games this summer. Uh, oh, so that, that's going to be different. That, that's going to be neat. Um, so it, it, it opens doors. It opens relationships. And, and I, I really, I really enjoy listening to Ty. He gives it a great perspective as a player and a coach. And, and you learn. I, I learn things that he says. Um, I learn things that Zonk says. And, and you, this, this game, it is. It, you never stop learning. And especially from, from our point of view now, where we, we kind of have to describe everything. I've, I've learned more about the game now than – I just I just grabbed the ball and threw it when I was playing. Now I have to kind of describe why that's going to happen and <laughs> why it didn't happen. So um, I enjoy what I'm doing. I, I enjoy being being in the booth and I enjoy my partner. And um, it's it's been it's been a lot of fun. How how tough is a bad game or a bad team? I mean, you got to come up with a lot of uh, stuff, keep it clean to say for nine yeah, innings. Yeah. If you got a bad club, I mean, you really have it, to it took ball. me. Uh, it, it took me a year or so to get Zonk to laugh, and um, <laughs> not, 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 now that now that he now that he understands my humor, sometimes he has to hit the mute button a lot because he's about to spit out his dip that he has in his mouth. Oh, it's it, 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 it is, uh, yeah. You, you do. You start making it. We we had French fry contest last year during a bad game. You know, what's your favorite French fry? Um, <laughs> you know, it's just it's just things you you start thinking about. Uh, and mine, mine were McDonald's straight and crinkle fries won. I don't know how they won. And then we didn't even think of, we didn't even think of waffle fries at the time. Uh, <laughs> uh, or sweet potato some, fries. Some, 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 some that, that was, I think that was Zonks. I'm not a sweet potato guy, but uh, if you are good, um, yeah. I like regular, regular McDonald's French fries. And, but uh, yeah, you, you do have to, to reach deep uh, sometimes to, to figure out um, what is it? One of those things, um, I don't know, to make something sound good that's really not. <laughs> you, right. you sometimes you can only you can only sugarcoat things so much, um, but we we've enjoyed it, and then the games that some of them get long, but um, hey, we we enjoy each other and enjoy what we're doing. And Ty, you filled in for him for the alumni game since uh, Zeke's out with his hip. I How know, and I, I watched the game. Now I'm like, I, I can't stay out anymore. This guy's That's gonna right. take my job. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll start calling Zeke about. Wally Pip. Yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna, run, I'm gonna jog Dawson next week. It's, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be a Palmero Will Clark thing. You guys might be hate each other next week. All this love. I, 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 got, I got a good idea. Let, let's go three man booth. Let's do that. There you go. Uh, yeah. There you go. I uh, it was fun. Obviously, it was fun. It's the first time I've worked with Keith before. And uh, I never worked with him and, and had a – we had fun. I, I, I think with even Zeke saying – and I, I got to watch Zeke and Keith. I don't know this is the right way to put it, but I got to watch them grow together um, through their broadcast because I was always watching the Longhorn Network, watching either Texas play to pick up what – you know, because we were playing them mm-hmm. or who they were playing, more than likely we were going to play. And, uh, and so it was always fun for me to hear his voice and, and uh, to hear him talk about baseball and, and, uh, and describe what was going on. And, but to watch them early in, the, in their career and then to where they are together now is, is you know, I don't want to say it's that far of a distance between where they started and where they were, but you can definitely tell 
um, the two have matched so well um, and worked so well together and do so well. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> and, uh, Keep going. And, but, it, but I'll be honest with you. If you take – it's not an easy trade. And you take two guys that were the very, the very best at their craft as college athletes. Right. Um, you, it, I think it's rare that you, you find two of them that are that, that were that good um, that can go and do, you know, be an analyst or be play by play or talk about the sport and talk about how the game is played and how young people, you know, succeed and fail and why and all those kinds. Of, I think it's hard. I think it's really hard to find. I think it would be easier to go find two great players and go stick them in a booth and, you know, but it's not going to turn out like these two do. Uh, I, there's no way. In my I mind. think they do a good job. A really yeah. good yeah. job. Really I don't good. think there's any question. And I, I think, I think that's the, you know, the popularity of Texas baseball has been mm-hmm. what it is mm-hmm. and for a long time. And, but I think that they've elevated uh, college baseball, in my opinion, who I'm a true fan of. And I, I think, you know, college baseball is bigger and better than it's ever been in the history of this game. And a lot of it has to do with ESPN putting faith into a game and then giving the microphones to people that know what they're talking about Mm -hmm. and having people produce a show and put together a show of quality to keep promoting college baseball. Um, And I think it has. I mean, if you you watch ESPN now, we get into the playoffs and when you get into Omaha, how that is so that's produced so beautifully and the game is is seen in a different lens now than it than it's ever been seen before um and i just i think a lot of it at the longhorn network and what zeke and zonk have done um has a, has had a huge effect on that um and i think if if i'm if i'm running esp which i'm not but if i'm running something like that and i'm seeing the the numbers and the success that that's having I'm going to go expand it. I'm going to go, you know, make it, you know, take it to another level. And they've been a part of the growth of and the popularity and the marketing of college baseball. There's no, there's no doubt in my mind because I watched it, you know, firsthand as a coach. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. I got one, I got one more. Where did you get the nickname Zeke? I just do it coming in as a younger guy after your group, (laughs) got to know you. Hey, you call him Zeke and, and Moreland Zonk. I mean, where, so where did Zeke, that start in high school, or is that a UT thing, or where is that? Where's that from? Well, I, I know this is going out on the on the social medias. Um, well, it's better than my name nickname growing up, which was Pee Wee. Which was what? Yes, I said <laughs> which was Pee Wee. Pee Wee. Yeah, you heard that. You heard that right. Pee Wee. Yeah. Um, I, my my oh. brother was in Little League, and and this this all kind of coincides. My brother was was playing for the Hawks and Sharks in Little League, and there was a Greg on the team. And it was the Pee Wee League. And so I was always out there bad boying and running around, and my mom would always yell, Greg. And so the Greg, Greg Hicks, um, came over and said, you know what, every time you say that, I think it's you're calling me. So why don't, let's just let's call him Pee Wee. And that nickname <laughs> stuck until I got to college, until I got to college. Uh, we won state in 82, and we got jackets in 83, and it said Pee Wee Swindell on it. And I, I, looked, I, I looked at I looked I looked at Coach Jancy and I, I go, Coach, I'm, I'm it's like kind of like um fast times at Ridgemont. I said this is my senior year, okay? And <laughs> I, I'm trying to, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to get rid of this this nickname. Can, can we take trying to get a date, but, Coach? I'm trying to get a but, date but, here. <laughs> Greg on there, yeah. And uh, of course, that's the first thing people think about Pee Wee is Pee Wee. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so so later on, Corky goes to U of H and somehow Corky became Cork and then Cork became Zork. And one day I went to the little college party. We we're going to watch five slam and jamma. And one of his teammates said, hey, hey Zork, here comes Zeke. <laughs> there you go. Yep. That's, it stuck. That's, how, wow. that's how it started. <laughs> That's so I, I'm glad it wasn't. I'm glad it wasn't Gork. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's taking David a while. It's taking David a while. I did. I was thinking through yeah, that one. Yeah, that's, he, he's on. He's on delay there. On delay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys, great catching up with both of you. It's it's fun seeing really y'all, good. And hearing all the stories through all the years. 
well, yeah, we we could go forever. I know we could go forever. <laughs> we we got we got a lot more. Ty, oh, Ty we'll have, more we'll have you on again. Trust me. Yeah, we'll have a part two, a part three, and a part four. But we got to let Pete and Kabli yeah, know about this one. We need we need to get Inky and Bosworth. How about that? Let's get Inky there you and go. Bosworth. Hodo. Go. With Hodo. That'd be great. With, With Hodo. Hodo. With Hodo. Hodo. Yeah. Yeah.